Ja, schönen guten Nachmittag. Wir haben, und da ist er auch schon, Malcolm Graham Wood hier wieder mit an Bord. Malky, good to see you. And nice to see you, Marcus. And now we will be trained in British English uh, once more. Uh, and we'll, talking, we'll talk about the oil price. Ich möchte das ganz kurz nochmal erklären. Äh, Marki war äh, zum Zeitpunkt des großen Einbruchs der Ölpreise, als wir im März einen zeitweise negativen Ölpreis hatten bei äh, Brent und bei Crude. Bei uns im Stream, wir haben auch dieses ganze Thema der Volatilität mal diskutiert mit dem Öl-ETF, weil man sich da hätte auch sehr schnell verbrennen können. Und äh, jetzt ist er also wieder mit an Bord und einer der Gründe dafür, one of the reasons you, you hear, uh, is uh, the simple fact that uh, the oil price is uh, tanking at the moment, or should I say declining, and if you look at the, the different sectors uh, of the S&P 500, uh, um das kurz zu erklären, die großen Überflieger natürlich ganz oben, die Fangaktien und das Schlusslicht, der gesamte Energiesektor, der von der Erholung an der Wall Street seit Wochen nicht profitiert, im Gegenteil sogar unter Abgabedruck steht. Marki, uh, before we dive into the fundamentals, und ich werde immer wieder mal uh, übersetzen, um, how come, uh, in your opinion, how come the oil sector and the oil price has not really benefited of the comeback of economic numbers. The, uh, you know, the ISM is uh, swinging back up. Goldman Sachs is talking about 35% GDP growth in the current quarter in the United States. Why is oil not benefiting and why are, all, why are oil stocks tanking? Well, the oil price has been uh, picking up slowly during the summer, but uh, only slowly because we cannot get rid of the uh, the corona 19 virus and the corona 19 virus is just having a, a serious effect on demand for crude and that means you know if you're at home you're not driving to work and you know there's there's less demand uh, and accordingly there's less refining capacity obviously uh, and, and therefore the, the oil price is un, under pressure uh, it's as simple as that at the moment But one thing that goes Yeah. Uh, but, but one thing, I mean, you're mentioning uh, the, uh, you know, less people on the roads, but that also, uh, you could also make the argument that traffic on the roads indeed have been recovering. If, and if you look yeah. at road traffic in Europe, uh, which is almost back to normal levels and in many parts of the United States, um, shouldn't the oil sector, should the oil sector not have benefited stronger than it actually did? Also dieses Argument, dass wir jetzt gerade auch während der Sommerferien immer die Phase haben, in dem viel Verkehr ist. Und der Straßenverkehr im Gegensatz zu den Fluggesellschaften hat sich von Covid-19 eigentlich relativ schnell wieder erholt und trotzdem hat der Ölpreis nicht profitiert. That's just the yeah. German translation. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I mean, the, the interesting thing is, of course, that you remember when we spoke some time ago that OPEC had put in place a plan to cut production And they thought that the next stage would be July, August, when they could start increasing production again. So they've actually started to increase production only uh, by a little. Uh, but I think they've worked out that that's backfired on them because although demand is picking up, exactly as you say, and it's going to pick up a lot more in the, in the last quarter of the year and next year, and they will see those stocks coming down quite significantly. At the moment, it's very borderline. And there's one other thing. Uh, when uh, West Texas crude gets to above $40, there are one or two people in onshore US of A, in particular the shale, that start to produce again from ducts from you know, completed, already completed wells, which have been taken off, off for the time being, and they can be brought back at very little cost. So we have a little bit more production from the US, a little bit more production from OPEC, And the demand that you were talking about hasn't come through strongly enough yet. But all the signs that I can see, like you are, the demand is picking up quite sharply. 
Now, S&P Global is estimating that the um, daily oil demand will be um, uh, uh, is declining by about 8 million, or has declined by 8 million, and will not come back to the 2019 levels till the year 2022, I think they estimated. Uh, yeah. w w what's your opinion on that? Uh, I don't think they're far away from the mark. The market is, uh, is, is has become seriously more economic because the capex and the cuts across the board that the oil companies seem to be able to make yet again um but uh and, and you know you've seen them cut 25 to 50 percent off capex opex and everything else so they're more efficient than they were uh, i think 22 is probably you know a, a bit tenuous but there's no doubt that you know the hundred million barrels a day, which that the oil market was uh, was due to hit at the end of last year, and was to go to about one hundred and two and a half million this year. Uh, it won't be that until next end of next year, uh, but the market will be just as efficient. These oil companies will be as efficient at forty dollars as they were at sixty. So wir sehen auf der einen Seite also, dass äh, die äh, Nachfragesituation äh, immer noch äh, relativ flau aussieht. Äh, S&P geht also davon aus, äh, dass die täglichen Förderquoten bei minus 8 Millionen liegen im Vorjahresvergleich und dass wir erst bis 2022 wieder die alten Niveaus äh, erreichen werden. Die Nachfrage ist also moderat, so the, the demand recovery uh, will take its time. At the same time, supply is increasing. Uh, uh, on the, uh, in regards to OPEC and in the United States. And interestingly, uh, Malkia, um, we are seeing that the uh, supplies, that the stockpiles in the United States are increasing again. And uh, yeah. Cushing is a, a very, uh, I think it's the biggest uh, storing site in yeah. the United States, correct? Yeah. So Cushing now uh, has the highest level of stockpiles since uh, May. Um, how is that influencing the oil price also going forward? Well, if you remember when we last spoke, it was around then because what was happening was that the, the reason for that terrible day when the, um, when the, the, the crude con the West Texas crude turned over uh, and there was nowhere to people to take the crude onshore, it was full, tankers were full offshore. Uh, and you know, at, the, at the time, the process was almost impossible, which made those particular gyrations in the oil price. And what's happened now is because it's, it is now, because the oil price has, has worked into this contango situation, that uh, with, with oil prices the way they are, it makes it efficient again to roll over your crude contra contracts and store the, store the crude. Storage is, it will become more expensive. It already has as more tankers are being used. It's much cheaper to uh, to, to hold the crude on onshore rather than offshore, um, but as long as you know it's you're not being you know, hit in in the wallet by having by having to store it, it's an advantage because uh, in three months' time you know you can sell it for more. Now, the market is, thinks the price is going up. That's really interesting. But when you say the the market thinks the price is going up, we're not talking about a couple of weeks. We're talking about the the, the fourth quarter. I definitely think so. But don't forget, you know, the fourth quarter is only two weeks or three weeks away. Um, and we've just finished the driving season. Monday was Labor Day, the end of the driving season in the, in the US. Uh, the, the mix of demand changes. Uh, obviously, we keep having um, gasoline and so on, but we need to have more um, factory heating and, and office heating and so on. That will depend on how many people get back to work, of course. Uh, but actually, there will be significant demand in the, in the, in the fourth quarter. And, and I see it rolling through to the next year quite strongly. Now, if you're talking, we're talking about the fourth quarter, however, and you just mentioned that the driving season has now ended, you know, vaca summer vacation is done. The schools are, well, virtually open. <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit of a nightmare for all of us, but there is this there is this window where seasonally the demand for oil kind of falls off. Is there something like a seasonal pattern in the oil market? Yes, and it's not just the um, uh, the seasonal position is very strong indeed, but obviously at the moment uh, the refineries are all set up to make gasoline during in the summer. And when they're, they're in the winter, they're not selling gasoline, they're selling fuel oil and, and heating oil and that sort of thing. So the, the refineries will have to 
come down for maintenance and for, sh for regular scheduled spring and autumn changes. So they'll be taking less oil off the market while they do that and when they come back and when the weather starts to get cold. Now, you know, this will make it one of those things that you and I could never predict. Is it going to be a cold winter in the US? Um, but if it's a cold winter, last year was very mild. If it's a cold winter in the US, there'll be significant demand for heating oil and distillates and so on. Das ist, uh, let me just translate that because it's an important point. Also wir haben saisonal bedingt uh, im Prinzip ein Fenster, ein Zeitfenster, in dem die Ölnachfrage und die Energienachfrage generell abfällt. Uh, zum einen, weil die Sommerferien durch sind, man ist weniger im Auto unterwegs. Das resultiert in weniger Nachfrage von den Raffinerien. Und der zweite Aspekt ist, dass die Raffinerien offline gehen müssen, um quasi umzustellen auf die Produktion von Benzin Richtung Heizöl. Und dieses eine, dieses Vakuum, das entsteht, kann dementsprechend, redrosselt quasi die Nachfrage nach Energie temporär und zieht den Preis runter. So, looking at the oil price at the moment, uh, Malki, and, um, uh, and looking at what we know in regards to demand, Uh, um, OPEC production, supply side, increasing supplies uh, it co in Cushing. Um, where, where, so the top in, in, in WTI oil seems to be at around $40. Um, where do you see it yep. in the short term, right? So where do you see it falling to, however, in the short term? Well, I mean, in the very short term, I think it could fall another three, four, five dollars, but I don't think it'll fall more than that. Um, you know, we, we're not going to go back to the, the March prices. Uh, and I, I think that there's, uh, you know, the, the point that you're making about the supply is that the, I think that the Saudis and today, you know, the, the, the Kuwaitis have done the same and cut their prices by 140 a, a, a barrel as well. They'll realize that there isn't a marketplace at the moment. And unless they cut back again, uh, which they're doing for uh, October crudes, Uh, the market will come down again. I think what will happen is they will tighten up supply and the market will start to pick it up, pick up again quite in soon. I, I wouldn't expect to see more than two or three dollars off the price at the moment. So two or three dollars, that's about um, seven to, let's say, seven, eight percent in, in, in losses potentially. Um, you just mentioned the Saudis and I will take questions from the community briefly. Ich werde gleich uh, Fragen von euch hier mit reinnehmen. So Saudi Arabia did something that they haven't done for quite a few months. They uh, are selling uh, their oil to Asia uh, at a discounted price and they are now also selling their oil to the United States at a discounted price. Also Saudi Arabien <coughs> hat die Preise quasi für Ölexporte, für deren Öl reduziert Richtung USA und Asien. What effect does that have uh, on the oil markets in the US? Well, the one thing that you didn't mention there, of course, is China. Uh, and China have been buying a lot of crude all the way through the spring and summer. And they bought it from the US as well, because part of the last agreement between China and the US was that uh, the China would uh, would buy crude from the from the USA, which they've been doing. Uh, but for a number of reasons, they've cut back their, their, their buying. They've cut back strategic uh, refilling. And their demand is okay, but it's just not running away at the moment from the, what they call the teapot refineries. So in fact, uh, China is quite an important part here. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, the, the way that the crude market structures is that Saudi Arabia, having been selling uh, crude to the USA, have suddenly found that, uh, uh, that their, U their Asian markets aren't paying the price that they were expecting to because of the increased supply. So because they put uh, more supply on the market in, in August and the markets have been and the, uh, haven't taken as much as they wanted, they've had to cut the price by the 140 a, a, a barrel. What role does the U.S. dollar play in this whole game? I mean, we had a, we, you know, everybody and their neighbor seems to be short the U.S. dollar at this point, which actually uh, leads me to go long the U.S. dollar. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised to see a bounce in the in the in, in the in the greenback. Um, uh, what role would that have? I mean, and what what direction do you think the dollar might be heading to? Well, it's crucially important. I'm not a, I'm not an FX uh, expert, as you know, but I have to say that you have to. You're exactly right. A weak dollar is good for the oil price. There's absolutely no doubt about it, as consumers will tell you left and right. And the dollar has been terribly weak. I've actually spotted the dollar, like maybe like you, 
in the last few days, just as one or two quite interesting people are buying the dollar at the moment, and and which is one of the reasons I don't think that the oil price is going to go up very much at the moment because I think the dollar will rise a little bit for the, uh, in the, uh, in the short term. And don't forget the short term, we're middle of September, takes us through to the election. So yes, you know, that's anybody's guess. But I would say that at the moment, from what I'm seeing in the market just this week, that the oil, that the dollar is beginning to firm up. You know, it's, it's really interesting. You know, I, I, I hate nothing more than having an interview guest that I always agree with. <laughs> but, I'm sorry. Uh, but but we're, on the, we are, we're on the same page because if you look at the stimulus level in the United States and compare it to Europe, for example, the long-term trend for the U.S. dollar should further uh, be downhill. However, uh, uh, on the short-term basis... Uh, the, I think there's a good chance of the dollar running back up a bit, not much, but you know, it could be a couple percentage, yeah. and that too, again, brings us back to the whole, to whole topic of oil. So we have the short-term uh, demand uh, uh, falling off. Uh, we uh, have the end of the driving seasons, the refinery switching. So uh, together with a possibly stronger dollar in the short term, uh, would basically feed into what you were saying: the oil price could probably drop another 7-8%. Um, in anderen Worten, wenn man das jetzt alles mal zusammennimmt und der Dollar sollte eine kurzfristige Gegenbewegung sehen, die Nachfrage fällt kurzfristig ab, äh, Raffinerien müssen umstellen, Sommerferien sind vorbei, könnte der Ölpreis also nochmals etwa 7-8% an Wert äh, verlieren. But that doesn't change the, the fact that if you look beyond uh, the fourth quarter, especially when it gets a little colder out there, that you should see yeah. a demand, um, uh, a price recovery in oil. Now let's talk about the, the, the stock market. Now you look at the oil pr uh, prices and then you look at the, uh, the, the stock market, the oil, the energy stocks. And I just looked at Exxon, for example, compared to the oil price. And it seems that Exxon has been dropping, for example, like many other energy stocks, have been dropping even more uh, than the oil price itself. Um, and the oil sector is one of the few sectors in the S&P that is actually oversold. Um, yeah. how, would you, how would you play the energy sector and the oil stocks at the moment, knowing or, or you know, thinking at least, no, none of us knows, but we think that the oil price might decline. How would you uh, deal with energy stocks? Would you stay away from them from now? Or do you think it's overdone anyway and you would start buying? Well... Um, if you look at the long-term chart, the oil price and the oil sector, the, the stocks, tend to track each other quite well. And when they go apart, all you have to do is make the decision is which one is wrong. Is, are the, is the oil price going to go down or is the oil stocks going to go up? Now, at the moment, um, I think the difficulty is that some of the oil stocks, the majors, for example, have cut their dividends and some of them have not cut the dividends. Uh, so on my side of the, of the pond, uh, Rodat Shell started the ball rolling uh, and cut their dividend several months ago, quite substantially. They have always wanted to, to cut that dividend. They've always felt that they were hostage to fortune and that it was going to be too high for too long. I've been saying for a very long time, ever since Macondo, that BP should have cut the dividend. I mean, halved it or more. Uh, because, you know, when you look at their cash statement, it doesn't add up. You cannot continue to pay such large dividends and to finance your portfolio of assets. They're all changing their portfolio of assets. They always are. At the moment, they're talking about moving into renewables and, and all sorts of things. But either way, they have to, the, uh, in my view, is they have to cut the dividend. Well, it's interesting because there were uh, uh, reports out, analysts uh, basically also saying that uh, in the long run, Exxon has a cash flow issue. They're going to have to cut the dividend. But I might, you know, just to bring this back uh, into memory also for our viewers, I think was it, it was Royal Dutch, right, that basically kicked off the first big dividend yeah. cut. Well, and you might think that, oh, my God, the stock is going to tank. You know, they're cutting the dividend. Yeah. And what happened is actually the, ta the stock went up. Also, das Interessante war... Also das Risiko von Dividendenkürzungen nimmt natürlich zu, äh, weil äh, auch Unternehmen wie Exxon einfach einen zu großen Anteil der Gewinne oder sogar mehr als die Gewinne ausschütten. Das funktioniert auf Dauer nicht. Und Royal Dutch hat damals mit als erster großer Ölkonzern die Dividende gesenkt. Normalerweise müsste man denken, dass die Aktie dann abverkauft. Die Aktie war aber danach, unmittelbar danach, freundlich. So in other words, do you think, Malky, 
if we go through a round of dividend cuts that uh, these candidates uh, um, uh, should, by the end of the day, even benefit? I think they will. I think people will realize that uh, it's no longer the sector that uh, is going to pay out, you know, eight, ten percent yields and the amount of money that they're putting away for. I mean, at the moment, you know, dividends from Exxon and Chevron and people like that are a bit like apple pie. And, you know, it, it just happens. Uh, it won't happen forever. Uh, and you can still have a little bit of apple pie. You don't have to cut the dividend altogether. In fact, it's quite interesting in, in, in our side of the, the water that one or two of the E&P stocks who've never paid dividends before have started to pay dividends. But um, in, in the super majors, you know, their, their, their cash flow tables don't add up with such big dividends. Now, looking at the, the different players in the oil sector, the oil uh, majors uh, to all, all the way the refineries to basically the... Um, the uh, oil uh, equipment companies, Halliburton, Schlumberger. Yeah, yeah. Which sectors would you be looking at if you would look at any of the oil sectors at the moment? Or the oil tankers, for example? Well, the, the, the tanker market is, is, is back to being very strong again. I mean, historically, obviously, tankers have been all over the place. And you have to try and pick your window very carefully there. Um, but, but, and, and I think they're, they're, they're doing just fine at the moment. The service companies like Halliburton and Schlumberger and so on, you know, tend to be the lead. As soon as things start start to look wrong, you know, they they go wrong because as soon as uh, the oil price starts to fall, the majors and you know everyone across onshore US of A uh, stops producing, stops drilling the wells. So Halliburton aren't sending the wells or the or the kit at all. Actually, that's beginning to turn around now. They've all had to have massive restructurings. So, that, you know, the service companies are looking quite interesting. Because if we're going to have a slight pickup in the, the end of the year and next year, they'll, they'll, they'll look a little better. And one or two of the ones over here are looking better too. Um, but, you know, but at the moment, I think that uh, companies that have cut their CapEx and cut their OpEx, some of the E&P stocks will be looking better. In the US, the E&P stocks look less attractive because they're so geared, whereas in the UK the, the, the gearing is less. The trouble is in the US onshore, one or two of them are being hit hard by the fact that they've got gearing and that the bankers are deciding what to do, not the, the guys who run the oil companies. Man, you know, one thing I love about having you on is like that. I, I just realized I have so little clue about the details of the oil industry. <laughs> also, yeah, well, I've had 41 years doing it. <laughs> so in other words, um, uh, the, when the heavy players in the uh, uh, oil equipment, energy equipment uh, industry start turning up, uh, you, 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 you do look at the major players, yeah. Schlumberger and Halliburton, as an indicator, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Is there any, if you look at opportunity and risks, you know, there's a risk of the oil price declining in the short term, oil stocks are down too, but looking at the opportunity and at the risk, is there an urgency to start building positions in, uh, in oil stocks or would you do the most difficult thing for investors, just sit on the sidelines and wait for the right opportunity? Um, well, I think um, sitting on the sidelines is probably right in the very short term. But then you can very, when it starts to switch and, and when it moves, the oil sector moves very quickly indeed. And you could find that, you know, it can move 20, 30 percent in the space of a few days. And unless you're agile or you're, you're, you're quick on the, on the mark or you're buying the, the, the options, uh, you can miss half the, the, the rise in the market very, very quickly indeed. I would be picking out the stocks that I like in the marketplace, um, deciding when I thought we had some bad days and, uh, and and just adding to portfolios. But just, be, as you say, on the side, waiting to plant money in. I'm waiting for the Saudis and, in fact, the next OPEC Plus meeting with them to say, you know, we've, we've actually pr probably producing a little too much. Uh, we'll wait till next year before we increase production. If that happens, the market will start to pick up. It's not going to race away. I've had $40 a barrel for my average price for this year in since about May. And about a month ago, when you know, Brent goes up to 45 and 46, I thought I was beginning to change it. I'm not going to change that till we're at least halfway through the fourth quarter and see where we are then. I think it'll still be 45 
for the year. But I think for next year, I'll be looking more at 55, something like that. So the answer to your question is that medium term, it's looking pretty good, I think. It's looking pretty good. Um, I mean, the question is, uh, does there have to be a trigger event, for example, the OPEC plus meeting or something to trigger the beginning turnaround uh, in the market? So in other words, you have to have a strategy to invest into this field. You have to bring time to the table. You have to also understand that there's a huge difference between uh, the quality of balance sheets in the oil sector. And yeah. by the end of the day, you have to really know what you're doing. Uh, like any investor should be, know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Also in anderen Worten, ähm, ähm, also das nehm, entnehme ich jetzt auch diesem Gespräch, es ist, ist jetzt keine übergroße ähm, äh, Eile notwendig, um jetzt sofort ähm, äh, in, diesen, äh, in den Ölsektor reinzugehen, äh, sondern eher sinnvoll, wenn man das Ganze längerfristig spielt, ins nächste Jahr reingehen, an schwachen Tagen langsam bei bestimmten Kandidaten aufzubauen. Aber nochmal, eigentlich brauchen wir so eine Art Trigger-Event, der letztendlich gesehen den Markt dann auch wieder mit äh, nach oben spült. Ähm, so let's go to the questions before we end our conversation. Uh, what about uh, the pipeline business? Philip 66, especially Thomas Heuwinkel is asking. Well, now, now the no first thing I'm going to do is, <laughs> Malky, the first thing I'm going to do is like, I'm going to make you repeat his last name as the German lesson of our stream today, Heuwinkel. Thomas Heuwinkel. Hello, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Sehr gut. <laughs> so what do you think about the, uh, about yeah. the pipeline business? But, well, this might be interesting um, because we haven't really talked about the election uh, much because, um, you know, if Biden wins the election, he'll be anti uh, oil and gas uh, a lot. He'll be anti fracking and he'll be very much anti pipelines. So that's your risk, in my view, on the pipeline businesses. I think that um, that if, if Trump won for any reason, uh, then more, you know, you get Increase in pipeline and increase in tariffs. I don't think that will happen if Biden wins. Interesting. Okay. Are there any specific pipeline companies? I don't know if you want to talk about specific companies. I don't cover them specifically, okay. uh, I'm afraid. Okay, great. Let's let's come up with the next question in in, in, in English question. Uh, so I'm not uh -huh. going to trans. I'm going to translate into German. Um, in anderen Worten, uh, die uh, wir haben einen schwachen Rubel. Um, und wie sehen die, wie stehen die russischen Ölkonzerne da, äh, wie zum Beispiel Luke Oil, äh, auch was äh, den Verkauf von Öl nach China betrifft? So here's the question for you, and it, uh, the, the question is concerning the, um, the Russian company, uh, companies, Luke Oil, the ruble is weak. Uh, Russia mu must be benefiting, or the oil sector in Russia must be benefiting from sales to China as well, no? Yeah, they definitely do. And in fact, you know, the, the, the Russian oil business is quite a good deal more profitable um, the, per barrel than, than most, uh, as you would expect, especially since they, they want those dollars. Um, and interesting, it's worth watching that Luke Oil tried to um, uh, buy a very substantial piece of acreage uh, on the west coast of Africa a few weeks ago. They, they got... Uh, uh, they the, 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 they didn't get it in the end. They tried to buy a big piece in the Senegal offshore from Cairn, as it is Woodside. The uh, the operator uh, enforced their ability to to buy it, um, so Lukoil didn't do it. But they're trying to invest outside of Russia at the moment. I see Lukoil everywhere I go, trying to buy assets out outside of Russia. Now, if you look at this on a global perspective, you know you're based in London. I'm based in New York. We're talking about Russia. Which of the oil companies would you prefer looking at? The European majors, the Americans, or the Russians? Or even Saudi Aramco, for that matter? <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'd buy Saudi Aramco because you know, the, the deck is not uh, in your favor in terms of, uh, of, of an even uh, keel and dividends and so on. Um, I, I think that uh, some of the Russian companies actually uh offer quite good value i think that um that in europe uh, you know that the one or two of our majors um you know total in particular because they've got an international uh, base and they've got a very interesting deal with uh, uh with qatar petroleum uh, which is going to be a very very big deal over the over the long term and of course norwegian companies look attractive as well uh, because they've made some one or two huge uh 
discoveries and you know are in oil at very very low prices and, so you know I, you know and of course you wouldn't have the the currency issue well you would have it to a certain mm. degree through the through the through the oil itself but um, one more question and then I would wrap it up. Um, nehmen wir noch eine Frage hier dran, finde ich auch eine schöne Frage äh, in Sachen Zukunftschancen. Europakonzerne wie BP und Shell, die äh, setzen bereits auf neue Geschäftsfelder, auf Zukunftsfelder. In den USA, wenn man sich Exxon oder Chevron anschaut, setzen die überwiegend nach wie vor nur auf Öl. So to translate the question to you, uh, Melki, um, looking, at, uh, looking, into the f uh, looking at the future and at uh, future trends, it seems that the uh, European uh, majors like BP and Shell are already investing heavily in alternative fields. Yeah. As opposed to Chevron and Exxon, they seem to still be very strongly focused purely on the oil market. How, what importance does that have for you as an as a, you know, oil trader and oil investor? Well, I don't think that uh, the BP and Shell are going to make a very much money from their movements into into all the various uh, areas that they're trying to. Um, but I think they will, in due course, uh, make themselves more ESG, as it were, uh, proper and, and correct by doing such thing. And I think some people will feel that Exxon and Chevron just by investing in the, the lower 48 or, you know, in, uh, in uh, onshore uh, or the Gulf of Mexico are sticking so straight on for fossil fuel. So, you know, I, if I was them, I don't think BP and Shell are going to do much with their uh, renewables uh, policy. They'll spend a lot of money trying to get into it. I don't think it'll be very profitable, but the fact they're doing it at all Uh, will make them more acceptable to shareholders. And there may be times over the next few years that shareholder power gets more and more to the case. And you, what happens if Exxon and Chevron in two years' time decide they have to get into renewables and they start putting their checkbooks or their wallets into the renewables market? It, anything can happen, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, the valuations on some of these things, you know, if, if Exxon decided to buy Tesla, Yeah, the recent share price moved upward before the recent fall. That would be uh, would be peanuts compared to what would happen there. Interesting, uh, Malky. I know you have to run. Um, I called you uh, yesterday, uh, short notice, and I really appreciate you coming on. It's always fun having you here, and I would like to point out one more once more. You will find Malcolm on Malkysblog.com. I posted that also on, uh, by, uh, on Facebook and will post it on YouTube as well. Uh, wer also Malcolm uh, auch außerhalb des Streams sehen möchte, kann das tun äh, bei Malkys oder Malkysblog.com. M-A-L-C-Y-S, Malkys Blog. To, you know, last time I called you Malkys, it's Malky for Christ's sake. I know that now. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be coming. Yeah. I'm going to be coming to London soon, my friend, and I can't wait yeah. to go to the pub with you. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait either. Thank you very much for having me on your wonderful show. Thank you so much for having time for us. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll talk to you next time. I've always got time for you. Thank you very much. Bye now. Bye. Und jetzt der obligatorische und finmasichere Risikohinweis von Mr. Markus Koch. Meine Damen und Herren, liebe Aufsichtsbehörden, ich darf Sie darauf hinweisen, dass die Inhalte in diesem Video ausschließlich der allgemeinen Information dienen und keiner Empfehlungen zum Erwerb oder der Veräußerung bestimmter Finanzinstrumente und somit keine Anlageberatung Bu darstellen. Insbesondere können Wall Street Correspondents und der Vortragende, das ist dieser Mann hier, nicht einschätzen, inwiefern die im Video gemachten Empfehlungen ihren Anlagezielen, ihrer Risikobereitschaft und Verlusttragfähigkeit entsprechen. Wer also auf Basis von Informationen in diesem Video etwaige Anlageentscheidungen trifft, trifft diese ausschließlich auf eigene Verantwortung und eigene Gefahr. Das wiederum bedeutet, dass weder Wall Street Correspondents noch der Vortragende, das ist immer noch dieser Mann hier, für Verluste haften, die sie dadurch erleiden, dass sie Anlageentscheidungen aufgrund von Informationen oder Kommentaren in diesem Video getroffen haben. <lacht> 
Vielen Dank für die Aufmerksamkeit und weiterhin einen erfolgreichen Handelstag. Mhm.